Good evening, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out to the second night of our Suicide Awareness Series. My name is Tammy Flip, and I work for the Sprinkle Green County Library District. And this great group of individuals has come together to bring you this extremely, extremely important information about suicide awareness. So last week we had our first session, talked about solutions, um, or talked about the big picture. Tonight we're talking about solutions. So we have um, another panel here tonight to answer your questions. You got cards when you came in. If you didn't, we will give you some. You can hand write a question and we'll have runners pick them up, or there is a uh, www.menti.com. You can put in that code and enter your question electronically if you would prefer, and we will get those to the panel so that they can answer them throughout the evening. Please send your questions when you have them. Um, it can guide this discussion greatly. Um, this is a really, really important conversation to be having, and we're gonna stay at it, and we're gonna continue pushing information out and answering questions and doing everything that we can to help individuals who are suffering, families who are suffering. Everybody can play a part in this. And this is just the very, very beginning. And we're very lucky to have these people come together and bring this information tonight. NAMI has been so wonderful. Burl has supported us all the way through this and brought in such great speakers and experts. We're going to continue on. Our panelists that have come from Cox and Mercy and other community organizations have put a lot of time and effort into this and um, I want to continue on and keep pushing this message out because of how important it is. We want to help our community move forward. We want to save lives. We want to focus on what's really, really important and we can do that. So this is just the very beginning. I want to turn this over to Stephanie so she can tell you a little bit about a video series that is happening and a photography display that is happening here in Springfield. So I'll turn over to Stephanie with NAMI. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Appleby. I'm the director of marketing for NAMI Southwest Missouri. Um, NAMI has partnered with Randy Bacon, Annie Bush, um, Dr. Baker, and Larissa over at um, Randy Bacon's gallery to put together a series of short films and portraits of individuals that have dealt personally with suicide. Um, we felt like this was something that we really needed to do to bring a face to the issues that we're facing here just in our own backyard. Um, these are maybe triggering for some people. They're very raw. Um, but also, I think it really puts things in perspective of what our youth and adults and grandparents, aunts, uncles, everyone is experiencing when you may see on the outside that they look perfectly fine. This kind of gives you some insight to what's going on on the inside. Uh, we'll have a premiere at Randy Bacon's gallery November 2nd, and we will give more information at the next series about that. So this is just kind of a little snapshot preview of what the project is. I don't really leave my house very much because I have social anxiety. So when I'm in like a, like even if I'm at a family place, I always try to isolate myself into a room or I go on a walk. Like a lot of my mom's friends that she's known for years now, when they do meet me, they're like, oh, we didn't know you had an oldest, oh. And then they call me the forgotten child. No matter what, everyone's gonna leave eventually because that's how I think of everything because not everyone's here to stay. Everyone's going to eventually leave you in one shape or another, even if it's in good or bad terms. Because my grandfather left, but that was on his terms based on he was dying. My dad left because he was cheating on my mother. I went through a very bad breakup, which put me deep and down to a depression to the point where I would go drive. And the reason why I was driving was because I was thinking about maybe today's the day that I'm just gonna go full speed into a stone wall. 
I'm going to do this. Uh, maybe I should tie a vacuum tube to one of the windows and keep myself in there and just suffocate and watch myself die. And to put it bluntly, yes, I've tried to commit suicide twice. I have two shotgun shells inside my shotgun case. I used to shoot trap when I was in seventh grade and I still have that gun. Um, but in those two shells, I have etched in the dates that I tried. Both times the safety was on, so there's gotta be something that like protected me in that way. So it's like a like reminder of like, you can stay strong. You can do what you can do to stay happy. You can keep yourself from not wanting those thoughts, but what I would say to someone that would, was in my shoes, or just in a way, that sometimes stuff doesn't get better, but there's gonna be ways that are gonna help you through those hard times. Yes, you might do it in your own ways, but suicide's not the way. It's not a second chance, it's nothing of that sort. When you look at yourself in the mirror, don't look at yourself as a fake person. I'm, time to put on a mask, it's time to do this, it's time to do that. Think of yourself as the most beautiful person on the planet. Because you may think of yourself as the lowest, but you might have someone that's on the side that you have no clue what their name is or what they look like, thinking you are the most amazing person on the planet. You may think of yourself as a void of depression, like a black hole, taking in every negative way. But really, make yourself be happy. Even if you don't want to be happy, just try. Like, think of something that made you happy. For me, it's thinking about the times I had for, with my grandfather. So think of that time with your grandfather, with your dog, with your family, with, with a friend. Think of something that makes you happy because you're the only one that could make you happy, like I have. Okay, so welcome to our second part of, of a three-part series here, um, where we're really trying to um, meet the goal of helping the community openly discuss the opioid, <laughs> I'm sorry, not opioid, suicide crisis, and, and, and come to a spot where we can talk about it openly without judgment, shame, um, or guilt. Uh, this is part two of a three-part series. Uh, tonight we're going to be focusing on solutions, um, both what's, on, what's in place currently and also what's on the horizon. Uh, and then next week, uh, we hope that you join us again uh, for our last session, which is on grief. Um, so the format of each of these three sessions, we have a panel of, of four tonight. Next week will be three speakers, um, and, and we'll get a new rotation of panelists each night. Um, as I said last week, unfortunately, you're my mic is cutting in and out. Um, that's all right. Um, so, but I will, I will do my best to, to keep the conversation moving. Um, and what we'll do tonight is I'll run through a quick introduction um, of our panelists here. We'll give them each a couple of minutes to, to talk about a little bit what they do, and then we'll jump into questions. As Tammy said to start, we really want this to be participant driven. So please do not hold back any questions. Um, I think last week, part of the reason we had some really great discussion was because of all of those questions that we had come in. So with that, we will jump into some introductions so, here. So immediately to our right um, is Elizabeth Avery. She's the Vice President of School-Based Services at Borough Behavioral Health. Uh, Elizabeth has a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. And prior to joining uh, Burl's team, she worked to improve school mental health in Indiana. She led efforts and presented at the national level in developing a multi-tiered model for school mental health initiatives. This work has led her to partner with more than 75 schools in both urban and rural settings. Amelia, to her right, is Samantha Sherman, who is a Missouri Prevention Specialist with the Community Partnership of the Ozarks. Samantha received her bachelor's degree in socials work from uh, Evangel University, and currently she works as the program coordinator for the Youth Mental Health Support Project at CPO which includes facilitating training for multi-county region. She is also certified as a youth mental health first aid instructor and a signs of suicide implementation trainer. Samantha is passionate about investing in the younger generations to improve and strengthen communities. 
Next to Samantha is uh, Dr. Salvador Sinaceros. He's a chief of psychiatry at uh, the Behavioral Medicine Clinic at Jordan Valley Community Health Center. Dr. Sinaceros is a psychiatrist at Jordan Valley Community Health Center, which uses a unique model that integrates psychiatry, primary care, pain management, substance use treatment, and perinatal care all under one roof. He's a fellow at the American College of Psychi Psych yeah, Psychiatry and Neurology, and he's published more than a dozen research papers and has been a participant in several national multi-center projects involving disorders, schizophrenia, and psychiatric genomics. And last but certainly not least is uh, Lynn Lemke. He is the Executive Director of Behavioral Health at Mercy Hospital. Lynn has a master's degree in both counseling, uh, counseling psychology and health services administration. Lynn has worked with the Missouri Hospital Association to promote mental health services throughout Missouri. He's also helped lead the Not Even One Youth Suicide Prevention Campaign in Kansas City. Please join me in welcoming our four panelists tonight. And I do believe I actually forgot to introduce myself. I am John Mooney with the Springfield Green County Health Department, and welcome back. Um, so our, our first question for each of you is just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you do in your position, and really what brings you to, to tonight's panel. Um, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm very excited to be a part of this discussion. Uh, I am new to Burl, newish to Burl, um, but I'm not new to the world of school mental health. So I've worked in that field for several years now. Um, really with um, what we're doing with Burl is this mission of bringing care to people where they're at. Um, and our youth, they're in schools. And so uh, oftentimes when we're working with schools, there's just such a large need, um, A, for bringing that access to care, but also how can we support our teachers in these endeavors? Um, I tell schools all the time, you don't want me to come in and teach one of your classes, um, but by default, our schools have become kind of the de facto mental health center. And so part of our aim at Burl is to really partner with schools and help educate and create resources, help um, raise awareness about how we can have classrooms that are more sensitive to mental health needs, how we can work together to prevent suicide. Um, and so really that's the larger mission of what we're doing with our new school-based department at Burl. Great, thank you. Samantha. All right, um, so the main part of my job is we focus more on the prevention side of things with where I work. And so that's kind of why I'm here today is we really um, like to focus on education and awareness within the community. So I do a lot of trainings regarding mental health, but also work with uh, substance use prevention coalitions and suicide prevention coalitions within our 21 county region. And so um, I'm really kind of there on the ground seeing what really needs to be done in the community through different assessments and evaluations that we're seeing there. Um, and the main part of how we're doing these trainings is through that youth mental health support project that was mentioned earlier. That will actually be coming to a close at the end of this month, but we just heard that we also just got a new grant that we can continue to do this project and continue to bring these mental health trainings to the community because we really believe that parents and really anyone that works with youth needs to be educated on what to say and do when they come across youth that is experiencing these thoughts of suicide. Um, and so that's why I am here today. Thank you. Next, Dr. Sinisaros. Um, uh, as the, the moderator indicated, I'm medical director of a large clinic at Jordan Valley. And I've been in psychiatry now for a lot of years. And unfortunately, I've seen a, an awful lot of patients that have attempted or committed suicide. Um, not too long ago, several years ago, we, I started looking at suicidality in a s different way. I started looking at it as, as being more data-driven. That is that there's got to be ways in which we can identify people uh, early on, way before uh, we have to hospitalize them or way before they're on a ventilator at, at, a, at a hospital. Um, we've done research at the clinic that, we're, that I'm at that has come up with some um, good data on this on how to do that. Um, I'm also here because um, one of the things that we strive for at our clinic is accessibility. That uh, at our clinic, you, people don't need to make appointments. They can walk in. Uh, I think I saw four walk-ins today. Um, we keep crisis spots open. Uh, all of our providers, there's five of us, myself, Dr. Clark, and three nurse practitioners, and all of us will take walk-ins just as they come. And I think that that's key to uh, uh, prevention is to get people in immediately and not having to wait for them to wait weeks and weeks and weeks to get in to see a provider. And last, Lynn. 
Thank you for having me here tonight. And I've been doing um, suicide prevention for probably more years than I care to admit. And um, really became a passion of mine over the last about 10 years of my career um, when I had actually had a uh, patient commit suicide um, in my inpatient unit. And, and I was determined that I was not going to make another phone call. I had to call a family member and say that, that their family member had died in my facility. And, and that kind of launched me into a whole series of what can we do to prevent suicide. And, and really, um, it's mental health, and we've got the speak up people here tonight, but there's, there's a lot of what we don't talk about. And we don't, we're afraid to talk about suicide, we're afraid to talk about mental health issues. Um, and and we've, we've got to start breaking down those barriers and, and that stigma issue. And, and I just want to say that as, as a healthcare professional and a person that's worked in the hospitals for, uh, again, more than 30 years, uh, even in the mental health community, the, the psychiatry community that I work with, I think we feed into stigma because we try to say we're different. You know, we can't treat mental illness, you know, so like at the Mercy, we're in a separate building, okay? If you look at your payer source, a lot of times you have to go to a different payer to get your mental health services. And, and so we really haven't done a good job of that. And so it's time to start fighting that stigma and, and to start reaching out and because because really, we can't afford to even lose one more um, student. We can't afford to lose one more adult. And so I'm very proud to say that, that just on Monday of this week, I got an email from the president of the Mercy Health System. And Mercy Health System signed on this week to the zero suicide campaign in the state of Missouri. And, and as part of that campaign, we had one of our child psychiatrists get on there and talk about our role and how we can play in that. And we had one of our family practice physicians who had lost her son to suicide and one of our admission people had lost their son to suicide. And so it really we're, the intent is, is that we've got to start talking about this. If we lost 50,000 people a year to influenza, some type of influenza, we would be going nuts trying to find a way to solve that crisis. And we lose 50,000 people every year to suicide and we just, we just close our eyes and say, oh, it's just mental illness. This is a preventable death. Every one of these is a preventable death. And I'm gonna do everything I can whether it be part of a panel, or to go out and talk to schools, or it be to work with my staff, or to work with young people that are being trained to get into mental health work. I mean, there's just so much we can do, and we've got to break down those walls, and we've got to integrate it. So I'm glad to be here tonight, and, and, and really part of the introduction was that, that we had this um, campaign in Kansas City that was part of Speak Up, was part of that, and we called it Not Even One, and the whole intent was, was to continue to work that. And so we really focused our efforts on trying to figure out what can we do in our community to stop this, and so over a six month period, we had 16 who commit suicide in Kansas City. All right, and we would say, we can't allow that to continue. And so I went out and was talking to people, and what can we do to prevent that? You know, and I went to one of the school, super, school superintendents, and I was talking to him, I said, what can we do, how can we help you? And I said, well, we know exactly what kids are going to commit suicide in our schools. And I'm like, what? You know exactly what kids are at risk? And he goes, yeah, it's, that's all of our mental health kids. And I said, well, you missed five of the six. Because five of the six kids who commit suicide were not in their mental health Category kids. Did they maybe have mental health issues? Absolutely, but they weren't kids that you would have captured in your, in your, in your group that you consider to be high risk. And so you can't tell, okay? There's not like, I can't take your blood pressure and say you're at risk of suicide. I can't, you know, there's no signs as far as physically that I can take a blood level and say, oh, this person is at risk of suicide. But there are signs, okay? And just like we're not afraid to take somebody's temperature, we're not afraid to take somebody's blood pressure, when you go into those scenarios, clinics, any of their clinics, what are the first things they do? They take our vital signs. Well, one of our vital signs needs to be those questions that ask people whether it's suicide. We had a young man that came in because he hurt his knee at a football game. He was a senior. All right, we had this. It was a Mercy um, Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. They screened every kid that came into that care clinic. That child screened in for suicide. All right, he came in for a knee problem. All right, but he was suicidal. We've got to be afraid to not be afraid to ask those questions and really take it on as a community and say we're going to stop. We're going to, we're going to stop it here in Springfield. Can right. I build on something that he, that he said? Of course. He, he said a really interesting fact was the fact that the school had said they're identifying these kids that have mental illness, and yet they missed a big percentage of kids that aren't identified. And in fact, the data shows the great percentage of people that attempt suicide or commit suicide don't carry a history of any mental illness with them. In other words, they've not been identified. Um, a smaller percentage are people that have chronic mental illness that go that. And recent information that's come out of Columbia University in New York indicates that there's actually two different types of suicidality. And the, the one that's the worst, or the one that happens to be the most problematic, is the type in which um, these people, sometimes it's in, uh, in our profession, they sometimes call it smiling depression. 
Um, these people respond very poorly to stress. And what happens is that a stressful event comes about and their cortisol levels jump up really, really high. Um, that cortisol level leads them to thoughts of suicidality and it's extremely impulsive. They don't make a plan, they just, whatever's available, if there's a gun available, they pick it up and they shoot themselves. If there's medications available, they take an overdose. And the problem is trying to identify that subset because the other subset has been identified by mental health. And so we're constantly monitoring them and the hope is much higher that we're gonna be able to help and prevent on that side, especially if we have the accessibility that we need. But that other subset, we don't identify. And the reason we don't is because, even though there's instruments out there to do it, the reason is because the people that are in the forefront, the people, the, the teachers, the primary care, the pediatricians, um, don't understand how to do that. They're kind of left at their own wits to, to figure this out, and typically they figure it out too late. And that's a great point. And let's stay in that, that kind of line of thought of, of recognizing early, right, and to help prevent that. So what are some of the common signs and symptoms that you guys look for or that the community members and, and people like me, right, that have no professional training, what should we be looking for um, in terms of helping to prevent it? Well, it, it, in actuality, there's a really good instrument called the Adverse Childhood Experience Score, um, which shows that people that score four or above uh, will have a greater incidence of, of suicidality by over 1,200%. And that's because those, those people, when they were younger, had their brains bathed in high levels of cortisol because they were victims of abuse, they witnessed uh, uh, um, violence, their parents were neglectful, whatever. Um, and if that test was simply given to people, given to the, the school could, could administer it to, to their un incoming uh, freshmen, at least it would start to identify that those people that are at risk are, that we know that these people are at risk if they're having stress, that then they have a pathway to see somebody immediately and get the help that they need. And if I can jump in there, because I love the ACEs study and just the valuable material that it brings to us. And one of the things that they, that there's some hangups about using the ACEs study, which you may have experienced this, is that there's some fear associated with asking some of the questions on there. So what it does is it asks about the, the history of adverse childhood experiences. Was there sexual abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence? And a lot of schools are, and, and different institutions, when they are approached with, okay, let's assess for this, they say, well, what do we do when we get the information? Because we're mandated reporters, and now we have to act on that. But the fascinating part about the ACEs study is you don't actually have to know what types of abuse or trauma these individuals have been exposed to. You just have to know the number. Because as he said, four or more, you're 1,200 times more likely. And there's a lot of other whole person health implications with that beyond just even the suicidality. Just knowing the number actually equips somebody to know, okay, this is when we need to intervene from a prevention standpoint. Um, if we are looking at our kindergartners and they're coming in with three ACEs or four ACEs, then we know automatically, we don't have to wait to see more warning signs. We can get them plugged into resources now. And that's how we become and we shift the focus from being um, intervention related to being prevention. And so the ACEs study is a great place to start. So it, it I always like to use the, the water spigot analogy, right? That's helping to turn down the spigot, right? To, to get catch that early intervention and get them in, into prevention. What about for those, the, I don't, I can't keep my analogy going, but what about those that, that we might have missed in that early, early intervention or early prevention stage? What are some of those signs and symptoms we're looking for? You often see kids that have, or, or young adults or adults that have significant problems with impulsivity in general. And, and that's, that's always a clue. If, if there's people that are impulsive for doing other things, that, that tells you already that they're having problems with that impulse control that they need, that when they come up with these thoughts, not to act on them. Um, and I think that that's, that's a sign that can be seen relatively easily, especially in, in younger kids, because you know, they're supposed to be sitting in their, in their classroom, but they have a hard time, they're impulsive, they get into trouble easily. As they get older, they start having legal issues. Um, but we miss that. We don't, we don't um, uh, start pointing that out. Again, I think because of what you're talking about, the fact that there's this stigma about, around it, and nobody wants to be labeled with having a mental illness, although it's perfectly okay to be labeled being diabetic. It's not okay to be labeled with a mental illness of some sort. And that's, that's where that problem lies and that big divide that we get. And it's, it's really hard to, as a, when I work with, when I work with families, when I work with um, 
the community and they say, well, how did I know? And, and I was talking to one of my psychiatrists that had his, one of his best friends, a physician, his son committed suicide. And he said, you know, if I just would have known. And it's like, well, he was telling you through a, a number of ways. Now we look back at it and say, he was refusing to go to school. Okay, school was actually the worst place in the world for him. And he was withdrawing. And, and you go back, you look at retrospectively, but, it, but a lot of times when I, when I go back and look retrospectively, and I, and I go out and I talk to an audience like this, and I'll say, well, my teenagers act that way. They're withdrawn at times. They're irritable at times. They're impulsive at times. They're all these things. All those are, are signs that, that could point to this person maybe being, maybe being suicidal. Okay, I remember when I, many years ago, when I first became a clinician, and I had to go, I was in a hospital, so I had to ask the suicide question. And it made me so uncomfortable to ask a patient come in, that came to the hospital that was seeking mental health services, are you suicidal? Okay, well, today I wouldn't think a thing about it. I mean, if I saw a patient, I'd come up right and say, well, are you having any suicidal thoughts? All right, that's, that's a mental health professional, okay? How many of us would be comfortable asking our daughter that question? All right, because we're afraid that if I ask that question, what? They might say yes, and they say yes, then what do I do? And in fact, even our doctor's offices are afraid to ask the questions, why? Because there might be a year wait to see a psychiatrist at the, at the psychiatrist offices, okay? Or there might be a longer wait for a kid to get in to see a child psychiatrist. And so, if, and so if you don't have the resource, you're afraid to ask the question. But afraid to ask the question means that people are dying, all right? And so we've got to start, and there's, and there's really, there's this little, it's called um, ASQ, it's just ask suicide questions. And they have three questions. And we simply ask those questions, and it's like, but we've got to be able to encourage the community. And the one thing that we've done a lot of work related to immunizations over the last 50 years in the United States, okay? And we're really trying to immunize our community against disease, right? And so we do it versus smallpox, okay? When was the last time someone had smallpox here? Well, 1936. probably, huh? 1936. What? Yeah, forever. <laughs> have we quit, have we quit immunizing for smallpox? I was there. <laughs> no, we keep immunizing. Why? Because if we immunize enough people, we can stamp out the disease. And so what we were trying to do in Kansas City was we were trying to immunize against suicide. And the intent was there was to create an entire community where we're aware of each other. So when we're in a school and all of a sudden Joey is sitting off by himself in the cafeteria and Joey never sits by himself in the cafeteria, that people would reach out and say, what's wrong? What is wrong with Joey? And try to create that. If we can get enough people aware of this issue, enough people aware of what's going on, so when all of a sudden we have somebody bullying a certain student, then we got other people to send up for that student. Why? Because we're a community, and we can immunize ourselves against suicide, okay? It's not as easy as a shot. I wish I could just give a shot, okay? And someday, maybe we can give a shot against depression, but we can't do it today, okay? So we've got to look at everything we can do to create that kind of herd immunity where, where we're so aware of each other that, that, and we're not afraid to ask the questions. I think a couple other symptoms to look out for, which are um, big indicators, would be, um, I know you mentioned withdrawing and refusing to go to school, um, not engaging in activities that they typically enjoy doing, um, talking about death, um, making statements about no longer wanting to be in pain or no longer feel the way that they're feeling, giving things away. I mean, these are all also indicators. Um, there's also the social networking theory, which talks about how suicide, if you look at, um, they, they can do some pretty intense mapping of, of how these things actually um, occur in, inside a school system or even within your community. And suicide typically almost occurs in clusters or suicide attempts. And so if, if, if a youth um, dies by suicide, then it's definitely important to be watching their peer group um, because the likelihood of suicidal thoughts occurring and within that peer group increased significantly. Um, so from a, even a community standpoint, a school standpoint, if we know that that has occurred, then it's definitely wise to, to ask that question, as hard as it is to ask, to ask the friends of the, of the individual um, who died by suicide, are you feeling suicidal, and check in with them because it does definitely have a ripple effect. And Go ahead. Okay. And to kind of add to that as well, I think sometimes, especially when talking about youth, typical adolescents can often also look a lot like some suicidal warning signs. So withdrawal from family 
can be very normal as a teenager, but if they're also withdrawing from their friends and different other social activities that they typically really enjoyed and they're not replacing it with anything else, that is when we definitely need to step in and do something about that. So just kind of learning how to differentiate between those two things. If it's a sudden change in behavior that's not really making sense, that's when it's a warning sign. It's not just a typical teenager being moody. Unfortunately, that takes us now to the next step. You've identified this patient. You've identified this. I'm sorry, I can't say client. Or <laughs> I can identify this patient. Now what, what are we going to do with this person? The, quite frankly, I've been here for almost 10 years in this community. I moved here from up north, from around the Chicago area. And accessibility to mental health here is terrible. It's probably one of the worst places I've ever worked. And it's a, it's a numbers thing. It's a numbers thing in that there's not enough psychiatrists, there's not enough psychologists, there's not enough clinical social workers, there's not enough therapists, there's not enough of anything. And we're left with identifying this group of people that need care, but we have no place, no, no way of treating them. And that, and that again, comes to that, to that accessibility thing that it's, to try to get them in to see somebody. I mean, we, we had a family friend whose who's, um, son was having some very significant problems. They called up their psychiatrist and said, you know, he's having some real problems. Can you come and see him? Or can you get him in quicker? And she said, well, he has an appointment in two months. I'll see him then. I said, no, but he's having problems now. Well, but the appointment's in two months. And the problem is that the model has to change. The model has to be totally different than what we're doing now and instead make it just as if it was an emergency room or an urgent care room where somebody can call up and says, I'm having problems, and the person on the other line says, be here at two o'clock, or go here at, at, at whatever time. But we don't look toward that because, you know, unfortunately we're stuck in this model that's very old, that started back in the 19, well, 1920s, something like that, and has never grown out of. So, one, you're doing my job. Oh, and asking the questions, and you're doing a good job of it. And I think I can probably just sit down the mic and walk away, but I'm not yet. Um, so I, I want to back up just a second because I think you're, we're starting to, the conversation is starting to go, what are some of the solutions? Before we get there, I want to back up to um, a, a couple of times when the point was made, um, it, sort of if you, see, if you see something, say something, right? If we see these signs and symptoms, we should say something. You said we should step in, Samantha. As an individual, what should I do? What should that stepping in look like so that if I step in, I reach into my tool belt and I don't have anything there? What are some of those tools, especially when we know that sometimes appointments are difficult? So what, what are some, what's some advice you'd give individuals to help? Care. You know, just, just sit down and talk with somebody. You, you don't even have to, have to say, you know, let's get you in to see a doctor or whatever. Just sit down and start talking to them. Try to get, draw them out a little bit as far as what's going on in their head. Uh, what they can do to help. Uh, oftentimes, unburdening that thought process to somebody else can be very helpful in, in getting those thoughts down enough so that then they can seek professional care someplace else. Unfortunately, like he was saying, people get scared. They, they don't know what to do. They back away from it. They Sometimes, even though they know there's a problem, they don't even ask. They won't say anything. So. One of the things in working with youth, so I've done a lot of trainings with youth on suicide prevention and how to respond in these situations, is I tell youth, um, when, you, when a, someone comes to you and says that they're suicidal or they're feeling this way, um, listening um, without doing any type of connection is a very dangerous way to be a friend, um, especially at the youth level. So we don't want that responsibility to fall on our youth. And so one of the things that we try to help them do is understand how can you connect them to maybe a school counselor or somebody who can is more um, credentialed to handle that. But then also what research shows us is that the more, um, the more sources of strength that we have tethered in our life, the more things that we have like healthy activities, mentors, family, positive friends, all these things that we can draw from when we are facing that type of adversity, um, the, the more able we are to bounce back in those circumstances. And so helping people get those things in place in their life um, and, and some uh, mental health care certainly and their health care access to medical care is in there as well. Um, so helping people get these types of um, uh, resources in their life is very beneficial. Um, we want to make sure that they're wrapped in those resources as much as possible um, and, and that helps people um, be resilient in, in general. 
So you, you kind of caught my clothes in here. So, so everybody take your phones out, all right? So please take your phones out right now, all right? And so one thing we can do is we can all, we can all carry around a resource with us right now, all right? So if you get your phone out and, and get, go to your contacts and type in National Suicide Prevention Hotline. All right, and when you get that in place, I'm gonna give you the number, but everyone should carry that number around. I hope you never need it, okay? But if it's 11 o'clock on a Friday night and you don't know what else to do, guess what? You can go to your phone and say, I'm gonna pull up that number. Now, some of you, like Adam, probably has it in his phone already, right, Adam? Yeah, there, yeah absolutely. Let me, I'm gonna check it afterwards, okay? But the number is 800-273-8255. Again, it's 800-273-8255. 8255. Now, one of the things we did to, to provide resources for people was, okay, I can hand out my cards to people. That's great. Okay. And we were in the schools and all sorts of work. And we handed out flyers. And we handed all this stuff out, right? So, so I just like the challenge as a community. Can we get an app for the phone for kids? Okay. Because what kid is ever more than three feet away from their phone? Never. Okay. And so we just created an app. And it had all the local community resources for kids. Okay, we gave it to parents too. Parents could have it. So, to, so we hope they never needed it. Okay, but if we could save one child's life because they had it right at their fingertips, all I had to do is pop it up. Okay, that came across in the Mercy email this week. That said, they said, okay, I want everybody who reads this email to pull their phone out and put it and put that number in their in their contacts. Okay, if I can get every doctor to do that in the Mercy Health System, you think we could get every teacher in the Springfield School District to do it? Okay, you think we could get you know, just more and more kids putting that kind of information available for them. We can provide them resources. Again, if we give it to them in a form that they'll use, okay? Don't give it to them on a business card. Don't give them to them as a flyer, okay? My kids are out of high school now, but, but, but literally, you know when I got most of the flyers my son got in school? At the end of the year when I emptied his backpack, all right? Because they went in there to never be found again, unless it got too heavy and he had emptied it out, okay? And so we can't just give them out stuff that we think, oh, that'd be great. Okay, we've got to give them tools they can carry around. It has to be available 24 seven. Yeah, so I think just having that open dialogue as well to be able to give them those resources is really important. And if you are starting to see some of those signs, just reaching out and actually saying, you know, I've started to recognize some of these things, is everything okay? And just starting that conversation and making sure that they know that you are a trusted person that they can talk to, I think is really important. Um, and then beginning to offer those resources. But um, also, just a little tip as an adult, if you are trying to have some of those conversations with kids and with teenagers, they oftentimes don't want to make direct eye contact with you because that can be a really intimidating thing. And you're talking about kind of an intimidating topic as well. So figuring out good times to have those conversations is also really important. Not every time is going to be the right time to talk about that. So maybe in the car when they're just to the right of you and you're able to not have to look at them constantly, they feel a lot more comfortable in an environment like that. So um, just bringing it down to their comfort level I think is really important too. And don't be afraid to look at their browser history. Okay, a lot of people will go online, start investigating death, suicide, it, it's, it's a shame because you can go on the internet today and you can probably find 50 websites on how to kill yourself, okay? Do we really need 50 websites on how to kill yourself? Okay, but they're out there, and believe it or not, people that are considering it go on websites and investigate. We had a person, it was an adult who came in, and uh, the only reason he, he didn't commit suicide was he'd gotten intoxicated enough, they had an accident, he'd already purchased the stuff he needed to kill himself, but he had a car crash, all right? And when the police found him, they found all this stuff in his car and brought him in. But think about it, that was a person that investigated and did all the work. The only thing that stopped him at that point was the fact that, that he had a car accident. And I also think we need to flip the coin a little bit and let's also talk about the fact that there's a large group of adults and older people. I'm an old man and the, the, the people that, although I see a lot of kids, uh, I also see a lot of older people, especially older people that are in really poor health and uh, it, that those chronic health problems, the chronic pain that they're in um, is causing a significant problem in their, in their ability to function and their ability to be independent and that's when they start to think about suicidality. One of the reasons we started the clinic the way we have it is because my favorite saying is the head's connected to the body. So anything that happens in your head is going to affect your body and whatever happens in your body affects your thinking. And we need to also start to think about those older adults with those chronic health issues um, and are we going to 
continue just letting them go to their primary care, taking their tub fulls of, of medications and nobody checking on them, nobody, nobody seeing if they're doing okay, nobody interacting with them, getting them to church, getting them to social activities so they don't fall into that thing that, you know, I'm, I'm worthless now, why am I here? Okay, so I've got two more follow-up questions and then we'll, we'll move on. So the first is this. If I ask someone about um, whether or not they're thinking about killing themselves or ask that question, and I get a no, am I free and clear, am I done, or do I need to have a follow-up conversation? How often, and what's that look like when you start to follow up? We always yeah. recommend, at least, at least in the hospital, we always ask the question twice in two different ways. And it's amazing how many times I'll ask, are you having any suicidal thoughts, you think about killing yourself? No, okay. Um, have you actually, have you, have you actually made a plan? Yes. Now, how, to, how can you say no to hear your thoughts, but yes, you have a plan? All right, and so, and so there's different ways you can ask that question, and it's, and it's worthwhile to always ask a question more than once um, and, and, and in, in a different way. Don't ask the same question twice, but ask, ask it in a different way. Have you, do you think your family or friends think you'd be better off, they'd be better off if you were dead? Okay, yes. Okay. I mean, morning, morning. As a physician, I ask two or three times if they're married because I'll get back different answers every single time simply because, you know, I, I don't know why, <laughs> because I live in Missouri, I guess. <laughs> but, but your point is very well taken, that you need to figure out several ways of asking this, several ways of kind of sometimes maybe skirting the issue a little bit, asking if they've, if they've uh, have you gone to church lately? If you know there were church courts, have you gone to church lately? And you start seeing that, then that brings them back to those ideas of, of um, that isolation. And... Okay, thanks. And then the, the one other one is, so if someone was a slacker and did not type in that number into their phone, and they, they, they come across a situation and they, they're having a conversation, they pull out their phone then to do that, what would you suggest them Googling or searching or asking Siri? What, what's that quickest and best resource uh, for, for someone that's that themselves is suddenly faced with trying to help somebody? If it's a crisis situation, I would just call 911 because we need to get them to a hospital, get them to somewhere right away. We're not gonna leave them alone and just um, have them kind of deal with it on their own. We need to get them to the hospital, I would say. No, no, I, yeah, I think so. I think, I think our problem is that once they get to the hospital, oftentimes they don't get admitted um, for various and sundry reasons, and then they're let go, to, or they go into the hospital. The hospital stays these days are three to five days. There's not much you can do in three to five days. So they end up, there's a huge percentage of people that go into the hospital, come out, and then commit suicide. Um, but I think doing anything you can to get them into a safe situation, at least for that moment, goes a long ways to helping. Yeah, I think as much as possible getting them connected to help. So you could certainly Google the National Suicide Hotline yeah. if you don't have that number handy. But even um, just like you were mentioning, you have a walk-in clinic. Burl has a walk-in clinic also. And sometimes the best thing you can do is take that person to the walk-in clinic or um, contact Burl's crisis assist team, whatever it is. Sometimes it takes being that person to say, okay, you d you're scared to do this. How about if I come with you um, and, and be that, that partner during that process and walk alongside them? So I would certainly say if you can, um, drive them to go get help uh, if they're willing to do that. The other thing, we've done a lot of work in the community and, and, and we've done a lot of work in training our police officers. So, so if you're really concerned with that loved one, call 911 and talk to the police officers. They're trained on how to handle this, and, and they'll make sure you get to help. The other thing you, we want you to do is, if you do bring your family member to the emergency room, is to stay with them and share the information, all right? And so the, long, the more hours that pass, okay, and we all think that if I go to the emergency room, how many of us think I'm gonna be seen in 30 minutes? All right, all right? And so literally, like the other day, we had 114 people in our ER at one time, all right? So we had a seven hour wait. Okay, what happens over the seven hours? The suicidal feelings diminish. They're afraid of what, they're, what the, the hospital's going to do. And so all of a sudden, they got brought in because they wanted to kill themselves. By the time I ask them the questions, they're denying it. And so I really need the police officers, I really need you all to come in and say, this is what's going on. This is what they've been telling us so that we can get them the hell they wait. If they come in and deny everything, and my hands are tied, I can't do much for them. And so we really need that information. So I always tell the police officers, when you come in, tell us what they told you in the field. I mean, we need to know that because... 
literally from the time they, they see the police officer, they see the ER physician, and then 30 to 45 minutes they're talking to my social worker or my nurse to be screened, guess what? It keeps getting less and less and less. Because why? Because they're afraid of what's going to happen. The second component is, is that we've got to stand our ground and say we need help. I have a 16-year-old girl in my ER last week. She had taken an overdose. All right? Her mother's with her. Her mother's insisting to take this girl home. All right? My kind of standard rule is you come in and you're suicidal, you've done nothing, yeah, we've got options. You come in and you've already attempted suicide, most of your options are gone now. We're gonna, we want to make sure we at least take your attempts seriously and get you some kind of help. The mom was like doing everything she could to prevent that, us getting that girl help. All right? What is wrong with this picture? All right? And it's because they were so afraid that she was going to miss a few days of school or, she was, or something, you know, her friends would find out. Guess what? Her friends don't even care that she tried to commit suicide because guess what? Half of them have done it too. All right? We, we did a lot of work in the schools and, and you know, we, we embedded a therapist in the school district. And, and so we were talking to the kids like, what should we call this therapist in the school? Because we don't want kids to be embarrassed to go. Like, should we call it the care, care person? We had all these really creative names. We talked to the kids and they told us to call them a therapist. <laughs> okay, duh. It's like, why should they, why, I wouldn't be embarrassed to go in there. Why should I think my friends would be? Let's just call it what it is. All right? So we've got to start calling things as they are and, and really getting help and, and stopping that, that mother, you know, literally from doing things. And again, what, what do you do? You know? So what we can do is report them for abuse and neglect, but, but it really wasn't that. I mean, it's one of those situations where you know, we finally let the girl go with her because we had a solid plan. But, but, but I was really almost embarrassed that I had a mother working harder to keep her kid out of treatment than to get her treatment. Okay, let's jump into some of the solutions. And this first question is for you, Elizabeth. So, with Burl's new initiative in looking to move into school, how do you how do you see that changing how care is provided in schools? Um, I, the whole goal is that we're we're normalizing um, getting behavioral health care and and. I love that they said just call it a therapist because we should not be contributing to the stigma of, of getting care in those kinds of situations. So we're really looking um, over the upcoming months, we're already partnering with several different schools in the area, but Burl has the mission and vision of making sure that we are a solid partner to every single school um, in all of our counties. And so um, in, in doing that, that we are actually sending providers into those districts to meet with students when they're in need. Um, and, and the school-based department is going to be doing that from a youth standpoint, but we also do have, a, like I mentioned, the walk-in clinic and a crisis assist team where we're doing this. Our mission as a community that we're doing this on a larger scale. Um, so the, the school-based department is really it's just one component, one piece of the pie in how we're planning on doing this for our community. Great. And as we, as we think about community, I, I think of Jordan Valley. Uh, so, do you mind talking a little bit about what is, uh, what's Jordan Valley doing to help prevent suicide? And then I've got a follow up, but I'll, I'll let you answer that first one. Well, the first thing that they did was to get me over there <laughs> a little over a year ago. Um, we had this type of clinic going at a different hospital, and we were able to move the whole clinic, lock, stock, and barrel, all the personnel, everything, over to Jordan Valley. Uh, that gave us the opportunity to be able to expand our services. Um, and they've made a very strong commitment, Jordan Valley has made a very strong commitment um, uh, to this process of access that um, in, in deference to everybody that's here, um, it's really good that, that we're trying to get people counseling and all of that, but ultimately they're going to have to see a physician. Ultimately, they're going to have to see a psychiatrist who can evaluate them and make a decision as to what medication, if any, or even more uh, aggressive treatment is necessary. The problem that we have is that that availability in this community lacks tremendously. Um, it's like this, like uh, like he said, you know, it can be as much as six months to a year's wait, just about everywhere. You know, one of the things that, that, that Jordan Valley was committed to was to get that access done with somebody that can actually prescribe medicine, that actually can admit somebody, that can actually do something uh, more aggressive to prevent suicidality um, by using this, this walk-in technique. Um, so when they come in, they don't see a counselor. They may, but 
you can be assured they're going to see a physician and that if appropriate, they're going to be started on medications. And if appropriate, I'm going to write a, a affidavit and send them to the hospital to make sure that they get admitted. Um, unfortunately, right now, every place else, any, any other place in this, in this community, that availability isn't there. And you know, I, again, I think part of the problem is, is numbers. Most psychiatrists in the United States are my age, so they're dying off like flies and retiring. <laughs> but the other thing is, is that um, um, with trying to get somebody into a community like here is difficult simply because they're the siren call of the big city for young psychiatrists coming out of training is just too big. They have big loans. They have to make a lot of money to be able to get rid of those loans. They figure, well, I'm not going to get that here. I'm not going to have the amenities here that I would have in Chicago or Kansas City. And so trying to get somebody here becomes very difficult. Um, so as my wife says, I'm never going to retire because I, I, I'm always going to have that, you know, that uh, cadre of patients that have to be seen. So, but I, you know, I don't see the model has to change. We have to stop doing what psychiatrists have always done. We have to stop. We have to leave it to these young ladies to do the counseling because they're extremely well versed in that. Um, they do a very good job and leave the psychiatrist to do what he does best um, because he can do that in a much shorter time than, the, than we can do therapy. And that allows more people to come in. It would be wonderful if I did psychoanalysis at an hour a piece, and then I would see eight patients a day. But that's not possible. So instead, I see 30 and 40 patients a day because there's a line of people going out our door every single morning to, to see somebody, and I'm not going to shut my door on them because I'm too busy with, with these long-term things. So. I think the other thing that we have to be very um, intentional about is figuring out how we get this same type of access into our rural communities where individuals don't have the resources and the means to drive to even Springfield or drive. Um, so even if with the six month wait, if you don't have the financial resources to put gas in your car to drive that far, um, then we're not going to make a difference. And so I think that that's one of the things that um, we're trying to figure out how to do as an agency, and we, we will figure that out because we're done admiring the problem. We're here to find solutions. And so how do we bring that access to care, um, you know, way out in the middle of nowhere where it's, it's definitely not an option. And as I've worked with schools and we've talked about um, ideas and how we can do that even at the level of bringing psychiatric care there, I've had um, superintendents, their eyes fill with tears because they finally have something that they feel like they're going to be able to provide to their um, kids who would not typically get it. Um, and even here in Springfield, there are families who aren't going to have the means and resources to drive 10 to 15 minutes, right? And so we have to continue to partner um, and shift from being like within our own building, this is where we provide care, to how do we integrate into our community and bring that care um, elsewhere. And I think that that's a very integral part of how we have a very large impact. So you guys touched on a couple of things that I, I just, I'm curious what the thoughts are. How, with limited resources, right, in Springfield and, and the whole region really, how do the different systems, Jordan Valley, Mercy, Burrell, Cox isn't here tonight, they were here last week, um, how do you guys partner together with so many limited resources and, and knowing that sometimes it's also partnering with a competitor? How does that work? Well, one of the nice things about Jordan Valley is that because it's an FQHC, we don't have any competitors. We work with all, all the agencies. We have a grant right now that we're partnering with Burl for the treatment of, of opioid dependency. Um, we've worked with Mercy many times as far as uh, taking their patients that have been discharged and bringing them in for outpatient care. The same thing with Cox. We have a, uh, we call it golden tickets where, where patients are coming out of Cox North uh, after an admission and they can go directly to see one of our providers across the street uh, the continuation of, of care. Um, that's one of the nice things about being in an FQHC. I couldn't speak for the other people as far as that's concerned, but. When it comes to the mental health world, we don't really have competitors. There's, there's, it's like we've got more than enough patients for everybody to share, all right? And so it's really more a matter of 
of us learning to integrate our, our services. And so the hospital has its role, all right? But like Dr. Scenario says, the, the body's connected to the head, and the head's connected to the body, and then the body and the head are still connected to a house, okay? And so if we think we can cure mental illness without addressing substance abuse, we're wrong. If we think we can do without curing homelessness, we're wrong, okay? And so, um, you know, we had this woman here about three months ago that came in, she was using meth, and she said, well, I use meth because if I don't, if I fall asleep at night on the streets, I'll be raped. So I take meth so I won't be raped at night. Okay, it's really hard to convince that person to stop taking meth, all right? But, but how do we get her off the streets, all right? And so, so, that, so all these things are connected. And so we all have our roles, okay? Earl's not my competitor, they're my partner, okay? Soon to be more than ever so. You know, and you know, Jordan Valley's not my competitor, okay, they're my partner. Okay, the school districts aren't my, are, aren't my competitors. I mean, there's a lot of services that are needed. We get, we're under, understaffed to provide the need. And so it's really a matter of how do we make the best use of our resources? When is it the right time to come to the hospital? Think, well, I got a suicidal person. Send the person to the hospital, right? The hospitals don't, don't stop people from being suicidal. We can stabilize them. We can keep them safe for a period of time. But, but when they leave, they're not, they may be less suicidal. But, we ha but, they, but they're going to need a Jordan Valley or Burrell if they're really going to address their suicidality. I mean, inpatient hospitals, as you know, it's like two or three days, four days, five days, you're out. All right? So it used to be that if you had hip replacement, you were in a hospital bed and you didn't walk for days. Now you get your hip replaced, you're walking that day. Okay, literally, we have you walking with a walker to the, to the bathroom because we can get that, that new joint moving immediately. And that's why we have to go with psychiatry. We can't just sit, have and have an appointment and say, oh, I'll just refer them to see Dr. Cisneros next week. Okay, well, you got seven days. The person just walked out of the hospital because they were suicidal. Can they really wait seven days to see somebody? You know, we can't. So we've got to just figure out how to really integrate our services and connect the dots for these people because it only takes one barrier for them to give up. There's a beautiful picture of how we're doing this right now at Hollister Schools, actually. Jordan Valley has the, they're doing primary care there, and they're doing dental services there, and um, we partnered together for us to be able to offer some behavioral health um, services, um, and then we're actually going to cross-train each other. Well, we're going to have Jordan Valley staff come and train all of our providers and vice versa on how to best utilize their system, how to refer to it, um, and streamline that process for the district. And so that's such a beautiful thing that we can sit down and do that and literally um, bring a full health clinic into that district. And so I think, um, like they were saying, there's more than enough need for all of us to sit at the table, and we have people that are willing to do that and say, how do we break down any barriers and stop looking at each other's competitors and be partners. So I think that that's happening within this community. Yeah, those are great points on all three points, and, and thank you very much for, for making them. Lynn, I want to jump back to you. So you talked about um, the improvements in, in treatment for a knee surgery, right, or a hip replacement, whichever it was that you referred to. What do you see for, for Mercy, though, those improvements in the realm of mental health and redesigning things and, and improving care? So we've... we've we're really doing a lot of work on that area right now. And, and so, um, you know, the one thing we've done is, and most people aren't aware that the Mercy ER is the second business ER in the state of Missouri. Uh, second only to Barnes Jewish in uh, St. Louis, which is obviously a little bit bigger than, than Springfield. Uh, but we can see up to 300 patients a day in our ER, okay? And if I called right now, we probably have between 80 and 100 patients in our ER waiting to be seen, okay? And of those, about 30 to 40 of them will have mental health issues. It'll be comorbid with their medical issues. And so we probably see between 20 and 30 patients a day that are coming in suicidal. All right, and so it's like, what do we do? Because we just got, I mean, at times we can have 50 to 60 people in our waiting room waiting to be seen. And so we've taken and created a whole new wing of our emergency room that's just dedicated for behavioral health. And so we can move people into that wing and it's, it's probably about a half a million dollars we invested in that wing and we're able to move so many more patients. And so we thought, man, this is really gonna address our need. Well, guess what? If you build it, they will come. And so now we are seeing twice as many patients as we were seeing before, which is good because, because there's a need in the community. Um, and so we're trying to improve those processes. We're also trying to look at how can we provide better short-term stabilization care to our patients and get people connected better. And so we've always had a close partnership with Burl, and we've got a couple of Burl staff that work one in our ER and one in our inpatient unit. But we're trying to figure out how can we create and so so one of the things that i'm trying to look at in our partnerships is 
is, is how can we better connect these dots? Because I've got patients coming back time and time again. And so when I have a patient comes in 200 times to my emergency department uh, because they're suicidal, how do I prevent that person from having to come back to the emergency room because they're suicidal? And so there, there's things like that that we're doing, um, you know, um, and, and then the next thing we're doing is, is we're getting ready to build the new pediatric ER. And so, and so hopefully by this fall we'll be breaking ground on a 30 bed uh, pediatric ER for the community, which will be a great service for the community. And so uh, any of you that got people that are on the board at Mercy, encourage them to look, think about, we need to have a mental health, behavioral health component of that pediatric ER. Because pediatric kids have behavioral problems, pediatric kids have depression, pediatric kids, and we've gotta be able to be prepared because when we open those doors, we're going to have suicidal kids walking through the door every day. And so if we've got to, we've got to keep thinking ahead of ourselves and saying, again, it's the whole concept and, and that if you build it, they will come. And we know that when we open that ER, we're going to be full. And so how do we address the behavioral health needs, the mental health needs of those kids when they're walking in the door? And those families and helping the families be on board with it. Thank you. And, and so we've been talking about treatment for a while, and now we're going to back up prevent, prevention. And, and Samantha, the floor is yours now to talk a little bit about prevention and, and really what are you guys doing with mental health first aid training? Okay. Um, so like I mentioned, we had that three-year grant that's allowed us to do the Youth Mental Health Support Project um, that's ending in September, but that has allowed us to really flood Greene County with a lot of these trainings. And what those trainings are is it... Um, is really for people that are on the front lines working with youth. Um, so people like parents and teachers and police officers that really see kids every single day or at least on a regular basis um, so that they know what to say and do when they do come across a youth that is experiencing some type of mental health challenge or crisis. Um, and they really leave the room after those trainings feeling ready. They have an action plan on what different steps they should take um, if they do come across someone when they're seeing those signs. Um, and they learn a lot about different types of mental health disorders and things like that. But along with that, now with this new grant that we have, we're able to do a lot more adult mental health first aid trainings as well. So we're not just focusing on the youth side, but we're also able to focus on some of those adults that you were talking about earlier. Um, and they leave with that same knowledge of what to look for and then what to do once they are starting to see those signs. Because we need those people that are seeing um, these youth and adults on a regular basis know what to do. They're not gonna, these kids aren't going to see a counselor every day that actually is truly educated on those signs. So we need others in the community as well to know what to do. Uh, and so, sorry, one quick follow up. So what's, what success have you guys seen so, so far? How many people have you trained? How many conversations have happened? How many meaningful um, prevention activities have you guys really had? So we have trained um, right around 1,700 people since we got the grant in the last three years. And um, when we do train those people, we actually send out a survey each month so we can see how many youth they are referring to some type of professional service, a self-help strategy, or even just some type of support strategy within the community. So that way we're able to see what that true impact is on these youth. And through that, we've seen over 16,000 youth being referred to some type of service um, within these last three years. So um, whether that is it was a crisis and so they're being referred to Burl or um, or it was just, I'm starting to see some signs of anxiety. And so I worked with um, I worked with them to get them connected to maybe a karate class or something like that that would allow them to work through some of that anxiety. Um, so it's a lot of different types of services that we're seeing, but we're hearing story after story of how youth have been impacted through that, and it's been really amazing. And if I can, I'm, I'm going to add in as a panelist for just a second. Our, our department jumped in yes. and, and went through that training and, and even though it was targeting youth, we had a lot of uh, a lot of our employees resisted because it was youth and, and they felt like they didn't work that much with youth. And I just tell from a personal level, um, we've had, we, I've had multiple of my coworkers and I know I've had several conversations myself with adults that we can't, we don't capture necessarily the impact of that, that I think it's just raising raising that bar of awareness and be able to have those conversations has been uh, invaluable to us. So, um, all right, we're going to jump into to some of the questions from, from you all out here. So the, the first is, um, and, and we actually had a handful of them targeting sort of this line of thinking, how do we help someone when we're, when we're not face to face with them? Whether it's someone that doesn't live with us, that, that is having suicidal thoughts or, or is resistant to that change, or someone that doesn't live within the, the community that lives 
in Illinois or lives in Florida or, or lives on the other side of the world, how do we help when we're not face to face with somebody? Obviously, that's not easy by the silence on our on the panel. Uh, <laughs> You know, a lot of it, I think, depends on the logistics as far as where they are. If they're in the United States, the, the hotline is available to anywhere in, the, in uh, the 50 states. And so that's always a place that, that, that can be gathered or sent, somebody can be sent to no matter where, where they're at. If they're out of the country, obviously, that becomes very difficult because of the fact that most countries don't have that kind of service available, except maybe in some of the, some of the European countries. But I think in the United States, uh, that hotline is probably the best alternative we're going to have to um, helping a, a family member or somebody who lives someplace else and getting them help as soon as possible. Fun of me earlier, can you hear me now? I was talking the mic out, but the route is we've got a lot of availability today, whether it be FaceTiming, cell phones, um, you know, Skype, whatever you want to do. There's, there's a thousand ways that we can reach out. There's a lot of resources um, with Google and everywhere else today. It's not hard to find resources available in communities. So if you were to type in suicide prevention in Chicago, Illinois, you, you'd, you'd find resources in Chicago, Illinois for those. So that's, there's, there's a lot more ability to reach out. And um, miles certainly can be a barrier, but you know, miles don't prevent you from expressing that you care. Um, you know, the, the United States Air Force uh, did a lot of work with people uh, when they had veterans coming back from war and were having suicidal veterans, and, and they found out that, that it was kind of a little thing that they did, but they simply sent out a postcard every, every month just encouraging that person to hang in there. And, and you know what? the postcard was almost as effective as seeing the therapist. You know, just having, and it wasn't a, a therapeutic message, it's just like, hey, we're thinking of you, hang in there. I mean, it was just like, or cheer up. It was, it was just a little simple card that we can do for family members, loved ones, people we know in other areas, just drop them that card. You know, I had a little point where my, my, my wife just had a birthday and, and my daughter was there and said, well, I'm gonna get you a card. I like getting cards, but I don't like giving them. You know, it's like, well, yeah, you go to Hallmark and it costs 5 or $10 to buy a card nowadays. But, but the message was she really liked getting them, okay? And so if we can do some of those small things, those small things think, well, what difference will a little card make? Well, what if it saves somebody's life? You know, so when you get that trigger, send a card, drop an email, drop a text. You know, it might be that little encouragement that they, they simply need. They, they may just really need that little word. Um, something else I think is just if it's like an emergency situation, we want to make sure that they're not alone. Um, and if they can, if there's, we can help them identify a, a different natural support, someone who's local, whether we stay on the phone with them until they get to the hospital, whatever it may be. Um, but then also just a fun activity to do with adults, kids, whomever, as um, there's a lot of science behind gratitude and that if we can list three things that we're thankful for every day, three different things every day for uh, consecutive 21 days, then it actually starts to... Um, rewire our brain chemistry to actually be more positive. And so even, that can even be something that you do. If you know someone's struggling, you can say, hey, every day um, I'm going to connect with you and we're going to say three things that we're thankful for. And that's just something small. But I think it's that idea of just constant engagement. People need to feel like they have someone that they're connecting with and that they have a relationship um, because, again, it helps um, bounce back when we are feeling down and when we, when we start having those thoughts. And so I think the more that we can connect and make sure that they're not alone, the better. Okay, and we, we just... Thank you. And we just talked about the um, sort of that reaching out to people, and I'm just going to go down that because there's a pretty timely question. When we are in crisis, we have that phone number, right, that you that you gave us, Lynn. Um, but also in keeping up with technology, are there other ways to access that? Is there an online chat? Is there a text option? Is there what other options are there to access that? I know Nami has a text a crisis text line. Also, you can get on Nami's website, and I. I can't unfortunately recall exactly what the number is, but that you can text them for help. Um, and I believe NAMI also has a, a hotline that you can call. So there are other resources out there. Um, and I, I think texting is actually a huge one that a lot of our youth like to use. And so it's a, that's another option. Okay. And, and then remember, there's there's just walk-in clinics available. Okay, so so literally, if it's not at night, literally... Monday through Friday, you can walk into the Borough, Borough Clinic and just do a walk-in any day. And you pretty much do the same thing at Jordan Valley. Um, 24 hours a day, obviously, there's people at, at Mercy and at Cox that are there to, to help you. There's, there's people available 24 hours a day. Um, and so, you know, 
use those resources. They don't, it doesn't always happen at night. You know, I mean, kids will tell you at 8 o'clock in the morning that they're suicidal. Yeah. So on that, we had a very specific question for Burl, that, that on the walk-in clinic, physically, where is it? How do you access it? Um, it's actually at our, um, on our main campus um, here in town, and we're, it's open Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 3.30. For there, by 3.30, you'll be seen. Um, and it's, I can give you the physical address. It's 1300 East Bradford Parkway, and it's in our, our building B, and there's arrows that point you in that direction. Um, and, yeah, you can just walk in, and, and you'll be seen. And then also they do a great job of making sure that there's follow-up care if needed. Um, so the, And it's ages 6 and up can be seen there. So if it is younger than that, if there are concerns, and we do have concerns sometimes with these types of um, um, issues, then we do uh, have a different process for accessing care, but six and up can be seen there Monday through Friday. Then outside of that, just so you know, we do have a crisis assist team that's available 24-7. Uh, the phone number for that is 800-494-7355. I'll say it one more time because I see people writing. It's 800-494-7355. Um, and it's the same concept where you can call somebody and they're going to assess with the, if you are needing immediate care and what to do, and they'll walk you through that process. So the crisis assist team is something that's available 24-7 via phone. Okay, so, and it sounds like when I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, when we have crisis, there's access, right? What about when we're not quite to, access, to, to a crisis? And, and maybe the, the person trying to, to help out is not reading the situation right or, or whatever and just wants to help plug that person in or the person won't admit that they need crisis intervention and they, they, but they're willing to go see help. What's the typical wait for that? And that's, that's where the problem really lies because that's where a, a call to Burl or to whoever, um, they may get, may get to see an intake person relatively quickly, but they actually see a, a physician or a nurse practitioner that can, that can prescribe medications or do whatever uh, is a long a long wait because of the fact that there isn't that, that aura of this is a crisis. And unfortunately what happens is that wait becomes so long that then a crisis does develop. Um, and so that's why when we formulated our, our um, clinic, the idea was that uh, we didn't put somebody in between, that if they came in, they were gonna see a physician or a nurse practitioner uh, right from the get-go. And, and typically, literally within sometimes just 30 minutes. And I think that that's kind of the overall goal. And, and even just so you, what we have an access in our walk-in clinic, regardless of if you're in crisis, you can come in and be seen. Um, but our access to our prescribers right now is 27 days. And I, I've heard this at Burrow a lot, that we're not going to stop until access is as easy as Amazon Prime. Um, that we want access to be that easy. And that it's not just in Springfield, but across our 17 counties, that access um, is a concept. It's not a place. And that we're taking that concept to wherever we go. Um, and so although we aren't that quick yet, we won't stop until we we get there because we know that it, there's urgency around that. There's also going to your primary care physician. Again, it's, it's a good first step. It's a safe step. Um, a lot of our clinics have access through televideo to, to mental health professionals right away. And so if a good first step can always be, again, the people that have attempted suicide, I think it's like 80% saw their primary care physician within 30 days before the attempt. And so, and so it is a good place to go. Um, it's a first step, okay, and, and getting your doctor on board can be a huge part. Uh, um, it's amazing how just having someone there to support them and walk with them through that process. And like I said, the body affects the head, and the head affects the body concept we were talking about earlier. We really, there are, you know, I mean, if you have chronic pain, you know, you talking to your physician about that can be an important part for him to, to start treatment for you. You don't need to, I mean, it's not surprising you'd be having some depression if you were dealing with chronic severe pain. Good. Okay, so to, to change the, the line of questioning here a little bit, we've had a couple of questions here coming from the audience that um, is really looking at the, the financial feasibility of it. So when we're really thinking about preventing suicide, how is access obtained when there's limited resources? Well, I have the big advantage of being an FQHC. And for those that don't, that don't know what that is, that's a federally qualified health clinic. And the mission of all FQHCs is to take whoever walks through the door. 
So it doesn't make any difference whether you have any money, whether you don't have any money, whether you have insurance, you don't have insurance. If you're there, you're going to be seen. Uh, unfortunately, with other, other institutions, there are barriers that have to do, do with that because you don't want to, in right police sale, because in fact, you don't want to then all of a sudden burden somebody with this huge bill that they, that, uh, they have to uh, deal with. Um, but that's one of the big advantages of, of being with an FQHC. Um, and at Burrow, we do have options. We have sl like sliding scale fees. We'll work with people with their insurance, and, and that sliding scale fee may mean that somebody pays nothing, and that's fine because we want to work with people with where they're at. And the other thing that we're doing with our school partners is that there's an issue of people having the ability and understanding how to access health care. One of the things that we want to do is make sure that people are insured not just for behavioral health purposes, but also for medical purposes. And so um, with our partnerships with schools that we're actually offering that service is if you have a student um, who's needing services and they don't have insurance, how can we help that family and again align ourselves with them and make sure that they get that access that they need um, for ongoing treatment. Um, and so I think that uh, we, can, we can work with people where they're at, but then we also wanna help them get the resources that they need for their family system also. And when it comes to the emergency room care, um, it's federal regulations. We have to provide care to everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. And so we, we just know that every year we're going to lose money on the emergency room because we're going to people walk in that have no insurance. But we, we take care of you anyway. That's, that's our obligation to take care of you. Um, and then really what we ask for people is just that they would work with us as far as, again, you know, if we send you a $10,000 bill because you came to the ER, you, you know, and you're homeless, what is your ability to pay a ten thousand bill off? You know, and so so we work with people all the time, and literally, we we'll, sometimes we write off. You know, we may take a hundred dollars for that bill and say, "Hey, we're we're good." Uh, now we can't do that to everybody every day, but um, but our obligation is always take care of people first, and and then we'll worry about the financial part second. All right, and and that should always be our our process wherever we go. Let's get the care and make sure if we save somebody's life. That's more important than, than what I can collect the copay. Okay, great. We've got two questions left. So the first one, um, I want to go back to, to what you had first talked about, uh, Lynn, and talking about uh, immunizations, because I'm a public health guy and we love immunizations. <laughs> it, if, you, if you could look in your crystal ball, right, and, and look out in the, the foreseeable future, what are, the, what are those big innovative things, whether big or small, what are the innovative approaches that our community or, or, or beyond can adopt to improve the situation? So our, our, the approach we took with the schools, and I'm hoping that Burrell and Samantha and everyone will take advantage of this, is that we just went out and educated and educated and educated because we really want to do is because they may not tell the teacher, they may not tell the school nurse, they may not tell the school counselor, but they might tell their best friend, all right? And so we've got to get the best friend to be our voice too, all right? And so if we can get everyone involved, okay, so that if we see somebody hurting, that we don't just look away, uh, but that, but that, and if they say something like a Lawrence, you know, sometimes I think people would be better off if I wasn't here, Warning, warning, warning. And so we need everyone on, on board to help that, okay? If, if I started grasping my chest right now, okay, what would, would, would no one in this room do, would everyone in this room do nothing? I would hope somebody would say, are you okay? I got you. All right? Yeah. And so why can't we do that for people that are having mental health issues too? Are you okay? Can I help? All right? And so, the, and, but we need everybody on board. It can't just be the mental health professionals. We need our entire community on board and, and move in that direction. That's where you get that kind of that her herd immunity, where we get everybody on board, because guess what? A lot of those people, if we look at you know, some of those posters that are around of the people that have mental illness and some of the, the most brilliant people in the world, you know, and so, you know, how many of us didn't laugh at Robin Williams, right? He was an incredibly funny man, all right, and incredibly creative, and yet he really struggled with mental illness. And so how many of us wouldn't want to help a Robin Williams? Think about what happened if he'd have died when, you know, when, it was, when he was, what was, what was the first TV show, Mark and Mindy? You know, what would we have missed? You know, a lot. You know, and so and we have a lot of people like that in our community. One young man that committed suicide in Kansas City had applied to go to the Air Force Academy. Do you know how you get, write an application to get to go to the Air Force Academy? You have to have your, your senator or one of your, st your representatives in, in, in Washington, D.C. write a letter of support. Okay, he got a no letter. So he went so far as to get there 
and get his letter sent off and be a candidate and, and got turned down, okay? So I always said that young man, if he just survived 24 more hours, he would have been resilient. He would have bounced back and been fine. But when he died, we all lost something, okay? We, I, who knows what he would have done? Had he, had he been the person that would find the, the immunization for schizophrenia? Maybe, we'll never know, you know? And so all these people have a value. Um, and so I think we just need to figure out how do we get our entire community engaged and supportive. When we get all get engaged, we can't be stopped, okay? It's not always the most talented football team that wins the game. It's usually the team that all pulls together and does their jobs and everybody, everybody plays a part. And that's what we need to do as a community. I think it's also the importance of getting the consumer voice because when he says community, he's not just talking about the people who are operating these businesses. And there's a lot of research that shows when peer influ influence, so whether that be youth, adults, um, when you have that peer voice involved and they're actually the ones that are leading the charge and they're, um, they are the ones that that's voice is carrying on that message, that the impact goes so much further. So even in schools, there's you look at the evidence-based programs, that, that peer voice is there. And so a lot of the um, evidence-based suicide prevention programs are involving youth as being leaders and saying that we are agents for change, and when we see someone who's hurting, we're going to respond and be a connecting agent to help. Um, and there's research that's showing that as many as one in eight high school students are isolates. And what I mean by isolate is that if they, um, if the entire school sits down and they list out their friends, nobody has listed this ind individual and they can list no friends. So they literally have nobody. Um, and so when youth are in tune to that and they begin to be connectors for those who are isolated and have nobody as a, as a resource, then we really start to see a change. And so I think um, being strategic and how do we get the consumer voice to the table saying that we want to be an end and we want zero suicides within our community is going to be an integral part of that. If I could interject a little, a little something here um, along the lines of new technologies or new, new things that are coming up, uh, we should also talk a little bit about the new things that are coming up specifically for treatment. Um, you know, one of the problems that why people oftentimes don't want care or, or don't end up going to the doctors because, because of the fact that they don't want to be on, on medications long term or they don't want to uh, suffer through the side effects of medications and, and um, rightly so, some of the side effects are pretty, are pretty significant. But luckily in the last few years there's been uh, several new things that have come out like genetic testing that can increase um, um, recovery by over 35%, and I'm talking about patients that have refractory problems that nothing else has ever worked. Using the genetics, uh, we can improve that outcome by 35%. We also have new medications that work almost instantaneously. We have um, uh, new ketamine-based medications that work with, and uh, the glutamate medication that work with an IV that within 15 minutes after the IV, the suicidality is gone, literally gone. Um, and those are things that are coming to the forefront that I think people need to remember too that that means that they're not stuck taking a Prozac pill for the rest of their life um, and, and all the, the rigmarole side effects that come with that, that they can actually get treatment where they come in almost like surgery, take out a bad appendix, and it's gone. You don't have to worry about it again. Okay, and I, I lied. I said there was one, two more questions, and we've got another one came in from the, the audience that I think is something we haven't touched on. I want to I want to give you guys the opportunity to respond. So we've we've talked a lot about sort of that crisis intervention, the the treatment and the services there. We've also talked about us, upstream. What about the long term therapy and the long term um, the the long ongoing therapy and counseling sessions that a lot of times third party uh, providers provide? How do they play into this role? There, there is a, um, somewhat of a problem in just numbers, you know, that there's, uh, there's a scarcity of psych psychologists and a scarcity of um, clinical social workers to be able to, uh, to do the long-term therapy. Um, these days, they use, commonly use cognitive behavioral therapy, which typically is a much shorter uh, version. Um, you know, it can be as, as few as just a few weeks, as six to eight weeks. Um, and then the other problem, of course, is then these people often will need outpatient care of some sort uh, on the medication side. And again, that, that becomes a, a numbers game and just, you know, how many people can one see and, and how, many, how much um, 
availability is, that, is there for physicians. But one of the things that is occurring, which is a really big plus, is that um, Cox, uh, and I think Mercy is part of it also, uh, has recently uh, sponsored a new uh, nurse practitioner program for, for psychiatric nurse practitioners that's local. Um, and there's a lot of nurse practitioners that are now specializing in, in psychiatric care and using those physician extenders will really help to broaden that ability to be able to give this long-term care. And I think, in all difference to my psychology friends, that licensed mental health workers, licensed uh, uh, clinical social workers do an excellent job for this also, uh, rather than have to go to that next step to a, to a PhD or PsyD psychologist. The other thing we're trying to do is we're really trying to take our counseling, our therapy, our behavioral services out of our clinics and put them in our primary care clinics. Make it so you don't have to go to a specialty clinic to get this care. This is really primary care. And so that, that's, that's a big part. And so in doing that, you know, it's like we, we, we have a shortage of child psychiatrists like everybody else in the state of Missouri does. Um, but, but we're looking at how can we use telemedicine to, to broaden that so we can serve, you know, more, more patients, more communities with the resources we have. And so if we look at doing that, then we, we, can, be, we can be better at what we do. All right, I can't afford to send a therapist from office to office because I spend two hours a day driving, which is two hours I can see patients or, or clients. And so, so we've just got to, we've got to be creative. And you know, it's amazing that I've been doing telemedicine for like 15 years in different different facilities. And it's like, you know, I, I always thought that uh, kids will take to it quickly, but the older people, the geriatric patients, well, it's probably well, we were treating this 80 year old woman with, with, with telemedicine. And literally, we started rolling her out in her wheelchair, and she stopped her attendance in just a minute, and she turned around and said, goodbye, doctor. For her, the doctor was in the room, okay? And if, if you've ever been involved in any type of telemedicine type of thing, it's kind of like if you're Skyping or FaceTiming your kid, pretty soon you forget that you're on the phone. And it's the same way with telemedicine. You, when you're there, the provider, it feels like the, the, the provider's right there with you. We can just, we need to be creative. We just, you know, think about it. Why do I have to go to a special clinic to see the psychiatrist? Why can't I see him in my primary care clinic? And then, again, all that helps to break down stigma. We now say it's okay to talk about this in my primary care clinic's office. Certainly, for those advanced cases, we need to go to a special clinic. But a lot of the stuff we can handle right there, um, if, and that's where we should do it. I think Burrell's trying to be very strategic in partnerships, too, and how do we draw in... Um, individuals who we may not typically have access to as, as new therapists. Um, uh, using telemedicine is certainly a thing, but then also being a good employer, right? And so um, if you haven't heard this from Burl, our, our, law, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to be the best place to work and the best place to receive care. And so we do have to make it a place where, where the, the licensed social workers and those individuals want to come and work, and that's something that we're working towards diligently because that is the only way we're going to increase access to care is making sure that people are coming and entering into this field and having a good experience with it. So we have all probably heard the data and how um, these, kind, the, these kinds of jobs, there's a lot of burnout and turnover, um, and we are seeing decreases in that within the agency because... And, that's because the only way we can meet the need is by having those employees. So I think that we're trying to do the best that we can in, in improving, improving that and, and drawing in more and more employees. Okay. And in our last minute or two, what is one thing that everyone out here, if you, if you have one request of everyone, what's one thing that we can all do to help reduce the stigma associated with mental health and suicide? Talk about it. Just talk about it. You know, Talk to your family about it. Tell them that you, you came to this panel discussion and that you learned this and this and this. And just uh, start being as if it's as just exactly the same as if you had seen Dr. Oz on TV with the latest craze and you're all hot about that. Talk about this. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. You demystify and, and make it... Um, for the lack of a better term, an ordinary thing to be able to discuss mental illness and be able to discuss about suicidality. I'm a salesman. Not really, but I'd be an awful salesman. But, but if you tell me what I sell, I sell hope. Okay, I really believe that we can help people. Okay, that we can all help people. And, and if there's one thing that I think that people in our communities need is hope. All right, when I think about the two young men that committed suicide, but I saw the video on this last week from Mercy. 
the, neither one of them, they both lost that. And you know what? Hope doesn't cost me much to give out. You know, and so, and we can all do that. And sometimes that hope is simply meaning, I'll walk with you, okay? I'm gonna walk with you, I'm gonna stay with you. And, that, and I know we can get through this and I know that you can get better and I know that, you know, hope, all right? So, so when we talked about trauma-informed care earlier in the ACES study, you know, one of the key segments of trauma-informed care is providing hope and a sense of a future, okay? And when you're really suffering, you know, it's hard to see that future, but it's there, okay? And that's why where we fit into is helping them get a glimpse of what the future can be. I think also beyond that, um, talking about it and just telling your own story. So what is your personal connection with suicide? Did you lose someone? Have you dealt with mental illness yourself? And just kind of normalizing it is a really good way to reduce stigma. Um, just personalize it and make people connected to it. Um, and that way that they feel the empathy towards this topic as well. Uh, one of the things that I heard recently that really stuck with me, and it's almost been I've had to retrain myself in the way that I talk about suicide. I don't know if anyone's ever heard Kevin Hines, and he has the message of hope helps heal. But he also talks about how we've really, um, the way that even mental health providers talk about suicide, sometimes we make it sound like they're committing a crime. Um, that when someone dies by suicide, that they've committed a crime, that they are acting selfishly and, and all these um, different things that we've heard stereotypically about suicide. So even watching our language and, and how we talk about it and death by suicide and how, um, you know, a lot of the research shows um, uh, that he's really pioneered has shown that um, people who die by suicide are actually doing themselves as a burden to other people around them. And so they're trying to do other people a favor. It's not an act of selfishness. And so I think the more that we can just have those talking points and tell people that and, again, normalize it, um, that, that this is a real thing that people experience, the more we're going to break down those barriers. Okay. Thank you. So with that, that concludes tonight's session. So first of all, please, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for their time tonight. I also want to remind you of two things. One, there's additional information out in the lobby here, and our panelists are also available for a, a few minutes if you want to speak with them individually. And then also, I hope that you consider coming back next week for our last, uh, last session of this series uh, that we'll be exploring grief. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your attendance. Yes. Thank you all for coming tonight. Tuesday the 25th at 7 o'clock. If you have feedback or any information that you want to leave us, please fill out one of your cards and leave it at the door. We'd love to hear what you have to say or what you want to see or what you think will help. Um, also, these conversations are sometimes hard. And um, if, it, if it's been a tough night for you, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming. But we also have counselors here. If anybody needs to chat with somebody before you go, please let us know. That's what we're here for. And I want to thank you again and the panel for tonight, and we'll hopefully see you again next week. Have a good evening.